All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Pulkit K. Agrawal, and I'm the founder and CEO of The Fifth Ingredient. And really excited to be with you all here today for the Craft Group Professionals Group and um, getting into today's talk about 10 steps to successfully implementing brewery management software. And so it'll be really interesting to get into this and just diving right into what it is. Um, as always, feel free to add in comments and you know, happy to answer questions as they come up. Huge shout out to Andrew as well for setting all this up and have, making this happen every year. And it's been interesting to see just the growth in the CBP community from the first spring virtual conference in April 2020, right as the pandemic was starting up, all the way to you know two years from now. So it's been really awesome just to be a part of that with Andrew and to see all the, the growth and everything else that's been happening. So in today's side of things, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna get into a little bit of my introduction. We're gonna talk about 10 steps to successfully implementing data solutions. And then we're gonna summarize things with key takeaways. So let's start off with some introductions. So my background is that I studied mechanical engineering at Harvard University and then was recruited to work at Ballast Point Brewing in San Diego as a process engineer. As a process engineer, I really focused in on the packaging equipment and in particular looking at it from a bottling, canning, kegging perspective, help, helping them launch nitrogen beer in bottles and kegs and then helping out with the expansion into Virginia as well. After I left Ballast Point, I started working, I created the fifth ingredient for ingredients in beer, water, malt, hops, yeast, and the fifth ingredient is data. And really everything revolved around how can we actually help breweries use their data to brew more and brew better. And during that time realized that there were other softwares in the industry and yet most people were still using paper logs, whiteboards, and spreadsheets for the entire process tracking side. And that's really where Beer 30 has come about. And at this point, you know, it's been a few years and Beer 30 is just constantly growing with breweries doing as low as 70 barrels a year, all the way up to 60,000 barrels a year. And what's been really interesting is that during this time over the last four years of going through this, it's been very critical to understand what really sets implementations apart that are successful versus not. And what I'm trying to hope to do today is really focus in on what are those 10 steps when it comes to actually implementing these data solutions? And what is it that sets things apart between a successful one and not a successful one? And it's gonna be really interesting to just put these aspects together and start diving in with that. So first thing about this is when implementing brewery management software, there are 10 key steps that every brewery needs to consider. And with that, the key here is that each brewery is different and needs to be treated this way with customizability. No two solutions are gonna be cookie cutter the exact same for each brewery. As we all know, each process can be different. There could be other things that are going on and so this becomes a really critical way to make sure that you are treating that particularly for your brewery and for your needs and problems that you're trying to solve. With that big disclaimer, trying to implement change can be hard. And we all know that unless you have proper buy-in and everybody's on the same page, it's going to be very difficult to make actual change happen. And so today we're going to be talking about some strategies and some tips to actually go ahead and implement some of those changes. And then finally, the cool thing about this presentation is that this can actually act as a guideline for most data management projects you want to implement at your brewery. The way I've broken this down is really setting it apart from not just brewery management, but just in general, all the different changes that can happen or projects that really dive in and bringing about changes to the status quo, right? And so this becomes a really cool way to actually start diving in on a proper game plan of what comes next when you're actually trying to implement software systems. So let's get started. So with the 10 steps, the breakdown looks as follows. Step number one, what are the biggest problems you're trying to solve? Step number two, understand the solutions in the market and the features required at your brewery. Step number three, explore combinations between full stack solutions and point solutions that solve your problems. And we'll get into what all of this means as we start breaking things down between full stack and point solutions and really what that means like. Number four, understand the usability across multiple devices and teams. Number five, understand the onboarding timeline and process. Number six, what is your budget and what are the contract terms and conditions? Number seven, calculate the ROI on the software or realistically even the ROI on the entire project as a whole. 
Number eight, leadership buy-in. And when we get into this, you will talk a lot about number eight and the importance of having leadership really buying in and the heads of each department really buying into the process. Number nine, putting together a go live date, timeline for implementation and sorry, timeline for training and the implementation processes. And number 10, ingraining the software usage into your culture. And so all of these aspects are super critical when it comes to really understanding what is it that you're trying to get done and how things are going to work out when it comes to actually implementing change at a brewery and in particular with brewery management softwares. So let's keep going. Number one, what are the biggest problems you're trying to solve? And so over the years of talking to over 600 plus breweries of different sizes, really there are certain key areas when you start looking at brewery management softwares that people across the board are super interested in tracking. And so these are just some examples. And again, none of this is an exhaustive list. And I'm sure there's other softwares out there, other aspects, other data points, things that you're really interested in. But at least this puts you on the right path to understanding really what comes next when it comes to implementation. So number one, again, what are the biggest problems you're trying to solve? Biggest thing that comes up is disjointed information. And for most people, what that means is that multiple data entries are happening based on paper logs, whiteboards, and spreadsheets. And really, between those different aspects of redundancy, you then have redundant data entry as well, right? We all know at times you may handwrite a six, it may look like an eight, or it may look like a nine, who knows, right? Like, handwriting can be very sloppy. And all of a sudden, you start going from a paper log to then adding it into a spreadsheet or maybe writing it down on a big whiteboard. And so, again, it leads to all of these redundancies and back and forth. And with that, you also end up getting a lack of a single source of truth. And so this becomes a really critical way in order to make things happen to actually understand what is it that you're looking at all in one location. So again, lack of a single source of truth is a pretty big problem that most breweries have when it's all disjointed. From there, teams not communicating. This is also really important because otherwise you start having people that are sending out emails or text messages, Slack, et cetera. And again, without a single source of truth, things can get totally mismanaged when it comes to that. Uninformed business decisions. And so this is super important because what tends to happen with this is actually understanding what's going on when it comes to recognizing trends or really failing to recognize trends until they're too late, right? If you don't have things that are automated or if you don't have things that are really diving in on the bigger picture, things are really not going to go as expected. And that is gonna to lead to bigger problems in the overall process. And then finally, hours that are wasted tracking on issues from either quality or costing perspectives. It may be that at the end of the month, as you're trying to reconcile your books, you realize, hey, I have no idea where this pallet of grain is, or I have no idea where this finished goods aspect is. And then you're trying to track things down and spending hours figuring out on papers, a piece of paper or spreadsheets, who fat fingered in numbers or where things are. So again, very critical when it comes to that from the accounting perspective or the inventory perspective, but similarly on the quality perspective, what happens if there's a yeast issue or there's a product recall from a particular grain supplier, again, being able to track that down and really streamlining it from hours into potentially a few clicks or seconds, super important when it comes to the problem solving side of things. Continuing this on, which we also have, is that one of the biggest problems we see is a lack of visibility. And again, tying with some of the examples that we're talking about, this could be along the lines of inventory. It could be brews in process. Imagine if your target is set up for, you know, a mash pH of 4.5, and all of a sudden your pH is coming in at a 6 or at a 3. Well, if you don't have that real-time visibility, it's really going to lead to issues of brews that are happening in process. Quality control side of things, what's happening when it comes to the consistent product. Understanding cost of goods sold, right? And at the end of the day, any brewery is trying to run a business, right? Any business owner, any brewery, head brewer, everybody cares about whether it's on the cost side of things and really understanding how much is it actually costing me to make that one pint of beer. From there, understanding the sales side of things and what's going on when it comes to the actual sales, volume, and inventory pricing just to understand how those pieces all tie in together. And finally, tax compliance, right? Whether it's looking at it in the United States when it comes to the Brewer's Report of Operations or TTB excise, state excise, or then even internationally, for example, in Australia and New Zealand and having a two-click excise tax return, right? Again, without the proper data points all tied in, 
there's a huge lack of visibility that could happen when you don't have proper systems in place. And so number one, the biggest takeaway is understand at your brewery, what are the problems you're trying to solve with this project or with this implementation? Step number two, understand the solutions in the market and the features required at the brewery. This is super critical because you want to do an analysis as to what exactly is out there, right? And so you start looking at really point solutions or full stack solutions. And I know that this can be a terminology that people haven't heard of before. So the way I like to describe it is that point solutions are really focused in on one key area versus full stack that focuses in on the entire process, right? And so this kind of gives you to understand where first in this whole assessment, you're figuring out what are the problems. Then you're looking at the solutions and what really is there from a point solution or department specific solution. And so here are some examples that come to mind in key areas of the brewing process, right? And at a brewery as a whole. Again, this list is not exhaustive, but I figured it would give people in the right direction as to what to start thinking about when it comes to different solutions. So first thing could be scheduling, right? And Brew Planner is a great example of a system that's out there from a scheduling perspective. You get into brew recipes and some of the common ones are beer smith or brewer's friend, right? Of be, being able to actually formulate the different recipes. Sensory, again, is something like draft lab, right? Barrels, you have something like barrel IT. Keg tracking, you get into keg ID by Hillbrand, you get into keg star convoy, right? So again, very specific areas that these entire solutions, these point solutions are focused in on. We get into brew process and quality. And one of the cool things about Beer 30 is that it's very modular. So you could just focus in on using it for the entire brewing process side, lab quality side, without ever touching anything on the accounting side of things or inventory side. And that's very similar to Grist Analytics, which is another player in the market that um, is really focused on the brewing process and lab quality side of things. You then get into like lab tech and lab services. And a great example of this is Firmly where you know, it's a lab services system that actually does the lab testing for you. You get into inventory side of things and two of the more popular ones are Deer Inventory and Unleashed. And both of these systems are mainly designed where they don't necessarily know anything about beer or the brewing side, but each particular ingredient or bill of lading or bill of materials is basically a widget, right? And so that's where something that's inventory specific comes in. You get into the accounting side. And what's really interesting is that you have things like QuickBooks Online, Zero, or you get into some of the bigger ERP systems like SAP, NetSuite, or Microsoft Dynamics, right? And again, these are all designed to really focus in on the accounting side of things, integrating with banks and getting information going when it comes to accounts payable and receivable from the bank transaction side of things as well. You get into hardware and automation. Examples of this are precision fermentation with their brew monitor systems. You get into OFS that uh, does packaging downtime. You get into Firmacraft, which does tank sensors and tank automation. Plato, again, doing fermentation tracking, or even things like the Rotec keg that actually look at a keg line and understand exactly what's happening there from a kegging perspective and kegging efficiency. And finally, a great set of examples from the point solutions is point of sale, looking at things like systems like Arrived, Square, Clover, or Toast. And again, just really focused in on key areas and really focusing on one aspect of what is it that the brewery needs when it comes to these point solution implementations. From there, shifting gears a little bit, let's talk about full stack solutions, right? And this is really where you start getting into things that are full brewery oriented. And in general, when you start looking at the industry, there's basically four key areas that full stack solutions talk about whether it's purchasing of raw materials and inventory, right? And really understanding what's happening from the um, items that are coming into the brewery. You get into production management, sales, and then finally accounting integration, right? And effectively, these are the four key areas that any full stack solution always talks about. And when you start looking at brewery management systems, these are basically the main players that everybody usually talks about. And again, the list is not exhaustive, but you have Beer 30 by the fifth ingredient, Ecos, orchestrated beer, crafted ERP, Brew Ninja, or Vicinity Brew, right? And again, the whole purpose of these are having systems in place that are trying to do as much as possible to give the overall big picture of what's happening when it comes to raw materials, inventory, production side, sales, and accounting. 
So again, trying to just focus in on the overall brains of the operation and again, multiple players in the market that do that. But what's really interesting about this whole aspect is step number three, which is explore combinations between full stack solutions and point solutions that solve your problems. And this is something I really want to emphasize because at the end of the day, there's going to be people that are very specific at what they do. And by no means is a full stack solution going to solve any of that, right? That's like saying, for example, me, somebody who's on the brewing process side is trying to go out and build a, a competitor to arrive on the POS side, right? Or I'm trying to do stuff on the hardware side and build a competitor to precision fermentation. It just doesn't make sense when it comes to people that are very specific at what they do and they do it well, right? And so that's really where the combinations become super interesting. And with that, what you're going to start understanding as you start diving in is that some solutions integrate very seamlessly via API. Now, what's an API? An API is an application programming interface. Basically, what that means is that you have system A being able to talk to system B. And what that means is that the value proposition is really focused in on, you know, how is it actually adding to the overall system and really understanding, do you really need the connection or is it a nice to have versus a need to have? And I really want to emphasize this because a lot of times you can understand that some systems talk to all these different APIs, right? And it sounds very cool when you're first learning about it that, oh, this is going to talk to X or Y, but really breaking down as to what's the workflow about, you know, system A talking to system X and really understanding what that is really breaks it down as to the nice to haves versus the need to haves. And with that, what's super interesting about this is that even full stack solutions can have a primary focus. And so that could be something, for example, where a system could be, quote, built with a brewer in mind, right? Versus, quote, it's accounting focused. And so these are different examples of having even full stack solutions that have their special uh, features or their actual pros um, and strengths that are there. And what's really interesting is that some solutions can work in tandem without syncing. So again, let's just step back to you know problem number or step number one, which was identifying the problems. At step number two, which is the solution side, really understanding that you could have multiple solutions that are working at your brewery without syncing to each other. A great example of this is having something like precision fermentation on the hardware side and arrive for the point of sale side, and neither of them are talking to one another, right? And similarly, you could have something like orchestrated beer, crafted ERP or ecos for the accounting or the inventory side or MRP side, and yet still keep using beer 30 from the process and quality perspective, right? And we have a number of breweries that use something like orchestrated beer from the financial side, or then use beer 30 from the process and quality side, really because those two systems work well for what they're trying to accomplish, right? And so this ecosystem is really much designed for you to understand what's going to work best for you between full stack and point solutions. And really understanding what's a nice to have versus a need to have to really solve those problems that you had to even begin this discussion in the first place. So from there, let's go into number four, which is understand the usability across multiple devices and teams, right? This is a key critical point of understanding just how implementations are going to go, which is understanding how many employees are on each team and how many licenses are needed. Right? Is this a software system or a solution that's going to bill you per user, per uh, team? Is it unlimited? How does that all tie in together? From there, what are the user permissions available for each team member? Right? Do you necessarily have something broken up where the brewers, for example, won't necessarily see all the financial details? Right? Or maybe you don't want the accountants to then see all the recipes or make changes to it. So again, user permissions are super critical associated with this. From there, is the system mobile, tablet, or laptop friendly, right? Is the experience across all three aspects going to be exactly the same? Or are there some limitations that come from something that's mobile versus laptop or tablet? And what's really interesting is that you start getting into some terminology that you may see around, such as web app versus native app, right? And the way to think about this is that a web app is basically something where it's real-time software updates across a browser that don't necessarily need approval from the app store. Right, so as an example, Beer 30 is a web app where we have full control over pushing out code, never having to work with the Apple store or the Android store in order to make things happen. And the benefit of that is also that it's accessible on any device with a web browser for the same user experience. And that's something that we've always pointed out is wanting the same experience. 
But at the same time, when it's native, for example, and it's actually based on a downloadable app from the um, Apple Store or the Google Play Store, you then get some benefits like real-time native push notifications. Right? And the interesting thing about that is that web apps can also have some workarounds, such as handling things via text or email alerts. So again, the point really being that this is a rabbit hole that I could spend hours talking about. And we can definitely have discussions later on about this. But when it comes to understanding at your brewery, really understanding what's going to happen in terms of the implementation and users. And how is that really going to work when it comes to making sure that everybody is getting the best experience possible and really on board with what comes next from the perspective of the actual brewing implementation side of things. From there, step number five, understand the onboarding timeline and process. This is super critical. And I think this is one of those aspects where if you're making a huge change, like a brewery management system or even point solutions, you need to understand what the timeline is, right? Is it going to take the team hours to get up and running, weeks, or is it going to be months, right? And the interesting thing is that as you start breaking it down and start doing research, each software system has their own cadence of what they recommend. And you can have some that you're up and running the same day or within a 60 to 90 minute session. Others can take anywhere from four to six to eight weeks, right? So Again, it's all an aspect of understanding the timelines and what does that actually look like. From there, what are the departments that need to be involved in the onboarding? And more importantly, how does the data flow across departments, right? If you're doing a full stack implementation on things, you're going to want to have the brewing team also talking to the accounting team and the sales team. And you're going to want to make sure that each department is not siloed out. But at the same time, you want to make sure that you don't have a two hour training session focus solely on brewing and recipes and yeast management, et cetera. And yet you also have your top notch salespeople also on that call, right? So it's again, finding out that nice balance of what does the timeline look like? What are the onboarding sessions? And then really what are the types of training that will be provided? Are you looking at ones that are specific to just the brewing side? Are you looking at ones that are sales oriented, accounting focused, and who needs to sit on those conversations? From there, which existing systems need to be maintained during onboarding? This is super critical, right? Because in some areas, it may just be it's as quick of a flick, right? And you just turn it on. And others, you may have to do a migration where you're looking at wrapping up the month, for example, in one system before you start off in the next system, just to make sure that your TTV reports, your brewer's reports are maintained properly, right? And there may be a few days of overlap. So again, super critical to understanding what systems are going to be in place during this onboarding process. And then finally, will you feel valued as a customer or are you just another number, right? And what this really means is what does customer support look like? Asking the company, hey, what is the average response time for customer service? And what do testimonials or reviews tell you about the support, right? So really understanding what is it that you're getting yourself into, right? Because you really want to do your diligence on this. And Understand what is it that the market is saying and what is it that is going to make you feel like, yes, this team is there for me when it's very difficult or things aren't working or have they been able to do this for a while and are they specialized in it? So again, very important to understand onboarding and what the timeline and process looks like. Number six, what is your budget and what are the contract terms and conditions, right? So we start getting into things like the total cost includes many easily quantifiable things like monthly licensing fees and onboarding costs, but also some are less obvious things like hours from the team needed to implement, right? And so when you start breaking things down, what you're really asking yourself is what is the cost of licensing, right? Are you looking at it per user, unlimited users? How are things diving in together? What are the onboarding fees look like, right? Is it somebody that says that you got to pay per session? Is it a flat amount and you get X number of sessions or is it all inclusive, right? Based on the monthly fee and it's free onboarding. What are the additional training fees? Is somebody going to start billing you after you hit the first three onboarding sessions? Or is it something where it's unlimited training as well, right? So understanding exactly what that looks like. And then finally, what are the estimated hours of training and implementation, right? So again, this is really important from a budget perspective of understanding, well, if you have seven people on the call for an hour and a half, well, that's seven hours of human labor that is not working at the brewery itself, but actually focus on this implementation or the training behind it. And then implementation could be a couple hours for a stock take, adding in recipes, et cetera, right? So really understanding how that all ties in together from a budgeting perspective. 
From there, how does it impact headcount, right? Do you need a new full-time admin or is the system designed in a way that it's actually saving you from hiring somebody else? And so again, very important to understand the impact of headcounts. And then finally, what are the terms of licensing, right? Are you looking at something that's month to month versus multi-month? Like, hey, you got to pay for the first three months or be locked in for first three months versus annual versus multi-year. It's a three-year deal, right? And really understanding for these terms, what do cancellation fees look like? And is it that you're still on the hook for all the payments or are you able to you know, break out of different aspects of things? So again, all tying in nicely with aspect number six of what is your budget? What are the contract terms and conditions? From there, number seven, calculating the ROI on the software. ROI, return on investment, right? And so the key question in this is, what is the break-even timeline for when the software pays for itself, right? And the cool thing about this is that it can be broken down into, for example, what are the number of hours that an employee saves based on streamlining the process? We all know just how annoying it can be to have, an, have the aspect of writing information down real-time on a piece of paper, then at the end of your shift, going onto a computer, manually typing in information into a spreadsheet, and then from there sending out the end of shift daily digest or email, that itself could be automated completely. And what usually takes you about 20 to 30 minutes per day is happening real time within seconds and having the system do the math or analysis for you. From there, what are the quality improvements and yield improvements due to the data and metrics that are coming in from the software? Right. Is the software that you're looking at helping you be more proactive, predictive? Is it focused on process improvement? Is it helping you track real time metrics that are coming in from sales, front of house sales, right? Wholesale distribution sales or what's going on from a lab metrics perspective and understanding is it helping you understand micro usage or C box readings or, you know, those types of ABV readings that are then being reported to the government. So, again, what are the improvements that happen by having these particular softwares or systems in place? From there, a really good example that I like to give, for example, is to really start looking at a cost of beer 30, for example, and looking at it being less than a pint a day, right? And we all know brewers have their daily shifting. And as a concrete example, the tier one, zero to 1,000 barrels brewed annually, core system of beer 30 is $125 a month. And if you break that down from an ROI perspective, taking 125 days, dividing it by $120, $125, dividing it by 30 days and two employees, is about $2.08 per day. And the hourly rate, if you're looking at it from an employee's perspective of $15 an hour, for example, if they save eight minutes in a day, the ROI on the software is paid off just in hourly labor, right? And the great example with this is that you can extrapolate from this in so many ways, right? Regardless of what solution you're implementing, being able to understand the breakdown of how many people are using it, what is the actual hourly rates, understanding from there, even on average, how many minutes of savings are needed, and then everything else that you get from a quality perspective, cost of goods perspective, a real-time stock take perspective, et cetera, are all benefits that are happening from an ROI on whatever route you're going, right? And so again, really breaking it down to the numbers, so that way it isn't a decision that's based on emotion, but really a decision that's based on an ROI business use case of saying, hey, even at our size, this makes a lot of sense. Or even at our really big size, we need these types of solutions in place to actually make the ROI come into fruition. From there, step number eight, my favorite, leadership buy-in, right? And the way I've approached this is that a lot of times for implementation systems, yes, it's the leaders that, you know, the owners of the company, the executive team that comes to us and says, hey, we want to implement this system. At the same time, though, there's so many people that are head brewers or on the packaging side or even on the sales side or lab side that want a system in place and are kind of worried about how they're going to actually get leadership to buy in. And so with that, the key thing here is that in order to implement things successfully, you need that leadership buy-in. And if you've done the first seven steps correctly, you basically built out a business case as to this is the ROI that's there in order to really make sure that the executive team and heads of, heads of each department are signed off on implementation. Right? And this becomes super critical in order to really make this happen, which is that people across the entire division, across the entire department, across the entire company that are impacted by these changes need to be a part of it. And what's really interesting is, is that if you're implementing a new POS system, for example, 
somebody that's a head brewer may not need to be involved with that decision at all, right? Because at that point, the brewer is just focusing on purchasing ingredients, brewing, and making beer, while the front of house and the tap room managers are the ones that are focusing on the POS side. But it's really understanding what are the heads of each department that are necessary. But a really interesting thing about this is that in terms of points of failure, what's really interesting is the waterfall effect. And I really like emphasizing this because it's a great example of what happens if you don't have buy-in, right? So for example, if the tanks and the BBT aren't packaged out of in real time in your brewery management system, then the filter team can't do their job of emptying out the FV and putting it into a bright tank. And the brewing team can't do their job of brewing into those FVs. So all of a sudden, this waterfall effect, you start having this aspect where if, let's say, the packaging team or the bright tank team is not bought in or they're not doing their entire job, it's going to lead to the filter team not being happy, which is going to lead to the brewing team not being happy. And this effectively is the biggest cause of failure for brewery implementations and brewery management system implementations, where you don't have the full buy-in, somebody down the chain doesn't get their job done, or even up the chain or up the waterfall where they're not getting that aspect done and all of a sudden it's stalling other areas of the system, right? And so this is why it's super critical to make sure that everybody is on board with what's gonna happen at the brewery and what the next steps are. With that, we get into step number nine, go live date, timeline for training and implementation. This is super critical. Set a go live date that works for all relevant team members and build out a timeline for milestone, right? You want to make sure that if you're saying, hey, we're going live as of April 15th, for example, then you have it set up in place that the first two weeks or first couple of days before that, that all the different pieces are in place. So that way on the 15th of April, you're doing your stock date and going live, right? And what you need to do at that point is build a go live checklist. And examples, and again, this is non-exhaustive, but things to think about if you're really implementing a full stack system is, hey, are you going to have to predefine your recipes, right? And what do the metrics look like to really be able to take your brew sheets and add those in from the recipe perspective? Taking an update in inventory counts and doing a stock take. And that can include things from the ingredient side of grains, hops, adjuncts, yeast, understanding things from a packaging supplies perspective and how many empty cans labels, lids, et cetera, that you have. Finished goods. How many cases or pallets of beer are sitting in the cold box? How many kegs are sitting in the cold box? Understanding the work and process when it comes to your tanks and understanding from that point, what's the recipe of the beer, the volume of uh, barrels or hectoliters, and the dollar value that corresponds to that. Understanding things like chart of accounts when it comes to balance sheets and accounting and understanding is this whole migration going to require changes, right? So if you're going from, let's say an SAP system to a QuickBooks Online system or Zero system, what's the migration look like for chart of accounts, right? And making sure that nothing breaks during that transition. Understanding vendor and customer lists, right? Are those basically in whatever accounting system it's there and you can easily import them or what does that process look like? And finally, even things like distribution price sheets of being able to really understand what's going on from a dollar value perspective for each distributor and being able to actively create those price sheets in the system so that way you never get into this aspect that a salesperson, he or she logs into your management system and all of a sudden doesn't even have prices set up and is trying to understand when they're on the go at a tap room, hey, you know, at a bar, hey, this keg is going to be $80 or $180, right? It's super critical to just have those pieces in place to really go live with it. And finally, step number 10, ingrain the software usage into your culture. This is just as, this is by far one of the most important aspects. And yes, all 10 are very critical, but you can go ahead and implement the best software system in the market. You could go ahead and get everything up and running, but then things can taper off where if somebody isn't using this real time and they don't implement stuff on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they want to do it for Friday afternoon while having a pint and all of a sudden something happens. They don't enter it real time on a Friday. Now all of a sudden it's or afterwards on a Friday, all of a sudden you're coming in on Monday morning, hot liquor tank isn't working, things aren't going right. And all of a sudden now you're behind by a week of data entry, right? And so that's where this whole aspect of software usage as a culture is super critical. And you may be asking, how do you make that happen? And so first off, 
set standard operating procedures, SOPs for software usage, right? And so some systems have an entire knowledge base that's there, or they have videos or training aspects of saying, hey, this is how it's going to work. But then you may have to tweak things, right? Where imagine you're making hard seltzer and you're like, hey, when it comes to the seltzer side of things, you want to go straight from brew all the way directly into bright tank mode, right? And you want to skip these steps of ferment or filter in between. Or, you know, if you're filtering into the same uni tank, these are the different aspects that you want to track. Or if you're doing centrifuge versus flash pasteurization, these are the data points you're tracking. Again, just setting those SOPs becomes super critical. From there, having a commitment to using the system real time. And the most success that I've seen associated with this is when people actually add this as part of a job description and say, hey, using this real time and entering in the data into this either point solution or full stack solution is part of your job description. And if you're not doing this over a couple of days, a couple of weeks, that's going to have an impact on your overall bonus or your overall metrics because now the leadership team can't have full visibility on what's going on. And that was part of the whole process of implementing this in the first place. So again, super critical about using the system and committing to using it real time. From there, having internal KPIs to see how the software helps, right? Understanding, hey, is everybody using it? Who's not using it? Do we need some more training? Aligning workflows between real world brewing and the software that you're using. This is super critical, right? Because if you're able to actually align those two aspects of real world operations and the software, where you're not jumping through all these hoops to make the software work for you, it becomes super important and super easy to then ingrain it because people that actively want to implement a system like that. Ask your employees for feedback on what they like or dislike about the systems, right? You as a leader may say, oh, this is the best system in the market. But if your employees aren't using it or they hate using it or they love using it, you want to know. And you want to know exactly what's going on that's making things work well or not work well because then you can reach out to the service provider and give them feedback and even ask them for more training or support, right? I can definitely say from our perspective, we want a happy customer. Happy customers are beneficial for everybody involved, right? It's an industry where everybody talks to one another and you wanna make sure that you are giving the best customer experience possible and you wanna make sure that you're there for training, support and making sure that if something doesn't work rightly or doesn't work well for the software or point solution at your brewery, do you able to really talk to the members, talk to the people on the other side, the customer support team and say, hey, this isn't working. Can you help us out with this and hope that they're going to incorporate your feedback as a feature revision, as a bug fix, hot fix, or really do what they need to do to make sure that your team is happy using this particular system. So in the last few minutes here, just to wrap up, let's look at the key takeaways, right? So first, when... Implementing a brewery management software, there are 10 key steps that every brewery needs to consider. Again, I'm listing them all out here and just going through them one at a time. Number one, what are the biggest problems you're trying to solve? Number two, understand the solutions in the market and the features required at your brewery. Number three, explore combinations between full stack solutions and point solutions that solve your problems. Again, you can have systems that are full stack that also work with different point solutions via API versus not API and just having it go through as two systems that are running in tandem to help solve different problems. Number four, understand the usability across multiple devices and teams. Number five, understand the onboarding timeline and process. Number six, what is your budget and what are the contract terms and conditions? Number seven, calculate the ROI on the software. Number eight, get leadership buy-in, super critical to make any big change happen at a brewery. <clears throat> number nine, come up with a go live date, timeline for training and implementation. And number 10, ingrain the software usage into your culture. But it's a super critical 10 steps. Again, like I said, this is not exhaustive, but hopefully it puts you in the right direction. And you're able to take these 10 steps and use it for other projects as well. Right. And these steps are really awesome because they are presented in a way for most projects to present to leadership that you want to implement. And this becomes a great way to have a very concrete thesis that you're then going to your brewer uh, owners, leadership and saying, hey, this is what we want to do. Would that take each step one at a time? And finally, talk to someone who has done it before. Right. Don't try and rebuild a wheel. There are literally thousands of breweries. There's many, many systems. Hundreds of them, thousands of them have these systems in place. 
don't try and rebuild the wheel. It may seem like you are the most unique particular use case when it comes to the brewery side. And yes, you may have some nuances and some very customized things, but as a whole, talk to somebody who's done it, learn from them and be able to go from there. So to wrap up, first, thank you to Andrew Coughlin and the craft beer professionals community. It's been awesome to just see this community grow up to almost 14,000 users now from back in the day being, you know, one of the first thousand users in the system. Um, if you're interested, send me an email, pk at the fifth ingredient.com, visit the website, and from there, uh, feel free to add on LinkedIn or on social media as well. So if you need anything, anybody's interested in grabbing more, talking more about this, definitely feel free to reach out. We'll be at CBC as well, and we're definitely going to be at CBP Connect. So looking forward to go from there and you know keep things going on both the integration side, implementation side, and just helping brewers brew better and go from there on things. If you have questions, feel free to reach out. Comments as well, all welcome. Awesome. So have a great day, everyone. Looking forward to chatting soon. Cheers.